reflecting, or even understanding the words that are said. Communications experts estimate, in fact, that only 10% of our communication is represented by the words we say. Another 30% is represented by our sounds, and 60% by our body language. In empathic listening, you listen with your ears, but you also, and more importantly, listen. With your eyes and with your heart. You listen for feeling, for meaning. You listen for behavior. You use your right brain as well as your left. You sense, you intuit, you feel. Empathic listening is so powerful because it gives you accurate data to work with. Instead of projecting your own autobiography and assuming thoughts, feelings, motives and interpretation, you're dealing with the reality inside another person's head and heart. You're listening to understand. You're focused on receiving the deep communication of another human soul. In addition, empathic listening is the key to making deposits in emotional bank accounts, because nothing you do is a deposit unless the other person perceives it as such. You can work your fingers to the bone to make a deposit, only to have it turn into a withdrawal when a person regards your efforts as manipulative, self-serving, intimidating, or condescending because you don't understand what really matters to him. Empathic listening is, in and of itself, a tremendous deposit in the emotional bank account. It's deeply therapeutic and healing because it gives a person psychological air. If all the air were suddenly sucked out of the room you're in right now, what would happen to your interest in this book? You wouldn't care about the book, you wouldn't care about anything except getting air. Survival would be your only motivation. But now that you have air, it doesn't motivate you. This is one of the greatest insights in the field of human motivation, satisfied needs do not motivate. It's only the unsatisfied need that motivates. Next to physical survival, the greatest need of a human being is psychological survival to be understood, to be affirmed, to be validated, to be appreciated. When you listen with empathy to another person, you give that person psychological air. And after that vital need is met, you can then focus on influencing or problem solving. This need for psychological air impacts communication in every area of life. I taught this concept at a seminar in Chicago one time and I instructed the participants to practice empathic listening during the evening. The next morning, a man came up to me almost bursting with news. Let me tell you what happened last night, he said. I was trying to close a big commercial real estate deal while I was here in Chicago. I met with the principals, their attorneys, and another real estate agent who had just been brought in with an alternative proposal. It looked as if I were going to lose the deal. I had been working on this deal for over six months and, in a very real sense, all my eggs were in this one basket. All of them. I panicked. I did everything I could I pulled out all the stops. I used every sales technique I could. The final stop was to say, could we delay this decision just a little longer? But the momentum was so strong and they were so disgusted by having this thing go on so long, it was obvious they were going to close. So I said to myself, well, why not try it? Why not practice what I learned today and seek first to understand, then to be understood? I've got nothing to lose. I just said to the man, let me see if I really understand what your position is and what your concerns about my recommendations really are. When you feel I understand them, then we'll see whether my proposal has any relevance or not. I really tried to put myself in his shoes. I tried to verbalize his needs and concerns, and he began to open up. The more I sensed and expressed the things he was worried about, the results he anticipated, the more he opened up. Finally. In the middle of our conversation, he stood up, walked over to the phone, and dialed his wife. Putting his hand over the mouthpiece, he said, you've got the deal. I was totally dumbfounded, he told me. I still am this morning. He had made a huge deposit in the emotional bank account by giving the man psychological air. When it comes right down to it, other things being relatively equal, the human dynamic is more important than the technical dimensions of the deal. Seeking first to understand diagnosing before you prescribe, is hard. It's so much easier in the short run to hand someone a pair of glasses that have fit you so well these many years. But in the long run, it severely depletes both P and PC. You can achieve maximum interdependent production from an inaccurate understanding of where other people are coming from. And you can have interpersonal PC. High emotional bank accounts if the people you relate with don't really feel understood. Empathic listening is also risky. It takes a great deal of security to go into a deep listening experience because you open yourself up to be influenced. You become vulnerable, it's a paradox, in a sense, because in order to have influence, you have to be influenced. That means you have to really understand. That's why habits 1, 2, 
and three are so foundational. They give you the changeless inner core, the principal center, from which you can handle the more outward vulnerability with peace and strength. Diagnose before you prescribe. Although it's risky and hard, seek first to understand, or diagnose before you prescribe, is a correct principle manifest in many areas of life. It's the mark of all true professionals. It's critical for the optometrist, it's critical for the physician. You wouldn't have any confidence in a doctor's prescription unless you had confidence in the diagnosis. When our daughter Jenny was only two months old, she was sick one Saturday, the day of a football game in our community that dominated the consciousness of almost everyone. It was an important game some 60,000 people were there. Sandra and I would like to have gone, but we didn't want to leave little Jenny. Her vomiting and diarrhea had us concerned. The doctor was at that game. He wasn't our personal physician, but he was the one on call. When Jenny's situation got worse, we decided we needed some medical advice. Sandra dialed the stadium and had him paged. It was right at a critical time in the game, and she could sense an officious tone in his voice. Yes? He said briskly. What is it? This is Mrs. Covey, doctor, and we're concerned about our daughter, Jenny. What's the situation? He asked. Sandra described the symptoms, and he said, Okay. I'll call in a prescription. Which is youth pharmacy. When she hung up, Sandra felt that in her rush she hadn't really given him full data, but that what she had told him was adequate. Do you think he realizes that Jenny is just a newborn? I asked her. I'm sure he does, Sandra replied. But he's not our doctor. He's never even treated her. Well, I'm pretty sure he knows. Are you willing to give her the medicine unless you're absolutely sure he knows? Sandra was silent. What are we going to do? She finally said. Call him back, I said. You call him back, Sandra replied. So I did. He was paged out of the game once again. Doctor, I said, when you called in that prescription, did you realize that Jenny is just two months old? No. He exclaimed. I didn't realize that. It's good you called me back. I'll change the prescription immediately. If you don't have confidence in the diagnosis, you won't have confidence in the prescription. This principle is also true in sales. An effective salesperson first seeks to understand the needs, the concerns, the situation of the customer. The amateur salesman sells products, the professional sells solutions to needs and problems. It's a totally different approach. The professional learns how to diagnose, how to understand. He also learns how to relate people's needs to his products and services. And, he has to have the integrity to say, my product or service will not meet that need if it will not. Diagnosing before you prescribe is also fundamental to law. The professional lawyer first gathers the facts to understand the situation, to understand the laws and precedents, before preparing a case. A good lawyer almost writes the opposing attorney's case before he writes his own. It's also true in product design. Can you imagine someone in a company saying, this consumer research stuff is for the birds. Let's design products. In other words, forget understanding the consumer's buying habits and motives just design products. It would never work. A good engineer will understand the forces, the stresses at work, before designing the bridge. A good teacher will assess the class before teaching. A good student will understand before he applies. A good parent will understand before evaluating or judging. The key to good judgment is understanding. By judging first, a person will never fully understand. Seek first to understand is a correct principle evident in all areas of life. It's a generic, common denominator principle but it has its greatest power in the area of interpersonal relations. 4. Autobiographical Responses Because we listen autobiographically, we tend to respond in one of four ways. We evaluate we either agree or disagree, we probe we ask questions from our own frame of reference, we advise we give counsel based on our own experience, or we interpret we try to figure people out, to explain their motives, their behavior, based on our own motives and behavior. These responses come naturally to us. We are deeply scripted in them, we live around models of them all the time. But how do they affect our ability to really understand? If I'm trying to communicate with my son, can he feel free to open himself up to me when I evaluate everything he says before he really explains it? Am I giving him psychological air? And how does he feel when I probe? Probing is playing 20 questions. It's autobiographical, it controls, and it invades. It's also logical. And the language of logic is different from the language of sentiment and emotion. You can play 20 questions all day and not find out what's important to someone. 
Constant probing is one of the 